Uh, for those of you who don't remember, and that's probably most of us, uh, we started two weeks ago looking at uh, the tiny letter that Paul wrote to a young man named Timothy, and 1 Timothy is the letter that we're looking at. <clears throat> and in this particular letter, Paul is writing to a young man who has been appointed in a place of service. Uh, Timothy had spent years, some think maybe even as many as a dozen years with Paul at this moment, and, um, and, and he's now prepared to do some leadership, and Paul put him in charge of a uh, pretty significant ministry. There was a church, a, a home church that was going on in the city of Ephesus, and uh, Ephesus was a major city in itself. It was just an important uh, commercial place. It had a lot of uh, people, a lot of activity. It was a significant location. And uh, Paul trusted Timothy strongly to allow him to have the leadership in this significant um, city to be at. But there was also uh, some incredible difficulties that had come here. Uh, there was a lot of... Um, false teaching that was coming into the church. There were some people who had gotten themselves into positions of prominence and then now were teaching things contrary to what Paul had taught, contrary to what they had heard and believed about Jesus. And so um, it was a pretty volatile situation. It was somewhat explosive. And here's this young man, Timothy, that now is placed in, in charge of that. And so um, it's a pretty big responsibility. Paul is writing back to Timothy a letter that he fully intends everybody in the church to read and to know and to hear. And I think that's why in the early verses, Paul makes it very clear of his call from God and uh, to be um, in the position that Paul was in because he was, he was telling Timothy what he wanted Timothy to do, but at the same token, he was uh, letting the whole church know that this is God's man and you really need to be um, interested in listening to him. So we're going to, today, we're picking up halfway through chapter one and we're going to see that along with other things here, you're going to see Paul marveling at just the, the mercy that God has shown toward him, toward Paul. The power of a testimony can be pretty incredible. We see in the Bible, you know, testimonies of people who have made radical changes. Uh, Paul, of course, is one, and uh, and throughout the New Testament, there's there's things where God has acted in people's lives, and you see that in the modern day world, we've seen many many uh, examples over the centuries of uh, people who Christ has just grabbed hold of and and turned their lives around, and it's really a wonderful thing. God has a tremendous power that he still does today, and he likes doing, he loves doing, he loves changing lives for the better, and uh, it's a transforming power. It's one where he wants to come in and, and have control and change everything and make it so that it goes well. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15 is a verse that many of you know, I, I, I recognize that, that uh, it's a verse that... Uh, was written that says basically that everybody who has a, a life-changing experience with Christ should have a testimony, a, an opportunity, a way of expressing what God has done. There was a before, there is an after. Now, not everybody knows that clearly when that happens, but everybody who says, I know that I am of Christ, had some time when they could say, I know I wasn't of Christ, and, and they can talk about what Christ has done for them. And he said, and in 1 Peter 3.15 says, we ought to be prepared to do that on any occasion. When anybody comes up to us and says, why are you different? We should be prepared to say, well, you know, um, it's more than just my mom and dad raised me right, or I, I had a better education, or I've had all these other talents or skills. It's a lot more than that. It's, it's Christ in me. And we should be able to do that. Anyone who's trusted Jesus as their Savior has something to say about that. Now, I think it's interesting that in the New Testament, at least six times that I can find, we have an account of the Apostle Paul's conversion experience. There's at least six times where it's mentioned and referred to and detailed to some degree. 
And I think that's just simply because it is a powerful testimony. It's a powerful experience that he had, and it's used of God to instruct others. We're going to look at 1 Timothy chapter 1. We're going to look at verse 12, and we're going to go all the way through to verse 20. I'm going to read that for you uh, to begin with. It starts off like this. I thank Christ Jesus, our Lord, who has given me strength, that he considered me faithful, appointing me to his service, even though I was once a blasphemer and a persecutor and a violent man. I was shown mercy because I acted in ignorance and unbelief. The grace of our Lord was poured out on me abundantly, along with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. Here's a trustworthy saying that deserves all full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the worst. But for that very reason I was shown mercy, so that in me, the worst of sinners, Christ Jesus might display his unlimited patience as an example for those who would believe on him and receive eternal life. Oh, now to the King eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. Timothy, my son, I give you this instruction in keeping with the prophecies once made about you, so that by following them, you may fight the good fight, holding on to faith and good conscience. Some have rejected these, and so have shipwrecked their faith. Among them are Hymenaeus and Alexander, whom I have handed over to Satan to be taught not to blaspheme. Well, as we look at these, uh, these verses, we're going to see uh, several different things. In verse 12, uh, Paul's reminding us that he was saved by God and by God alone, and that by being saved, God had a purpose for that, and he wanted him to serve. There's a process that people have to go through to come to salvation in Christ, uh, and, and everybody has to go through this process. There are no exceptions. There's no shortcuts. There's no other ways around it. Uh, the process goes something like this. It can vary a little bit, but people have to recognize that they are lost. We have to realize that we are lost, that, that we are helpless in our sins, and there's nothing that we can do, that we are unable in and of ourselves to change that situation. We can't do it. I can't do anything that will impress God so much that he will say, you know what? I forgive and forget all that other stuff. You are so impressive. And then somewhere in that process when we become lost, and I remember in seminary they used to tell us that if you can convince people they're lost, they'll beg you to want to get saved. And I don't know if it's quite that true, but it's close. Um, but we're lost and we're helpless and we can't save ourselves. And somewhere in that process, we need to hear the voice of Jesus bidding us to come to him. <clears throat> And then we come to Christ, and we come to him in all of our sin, with all of it there. You know, I've heard over the years, and I don't hear this all the time, but I have heard over the years people who will say things like, well, I'll do that, but I want to quit this or stop that or get this in order first. And you can't do that. Uh, if you try to get your life to a point that you think is acceptable, you'll never get it to that point. It will never, ever happen. It's impossible because we cannot do anything like that that's going to bring us into a standard that's acceptable to God. We come to him with all of our baggage, all of it, all of our sin, and we come open and honest with him and we just lay it before him. And then we trust him. And when we trust that Jesus did die, that he did make a payment for sin, and that he does want me to experience that and have that as my forgiveness, that what he did on the cross is in payment for me, then when we trust him, then we're saved. That's Paul's experience, and that's what he would teach, and that's what Timothy is told to teach. And, uh, but going on in their culture and in their day, some others were presenting a false gospel. Now, this might be a surprise to you, but I think there's people in the United States of America today that are presenting a false gospel. Can you believe that? That there are people who don't understand 
this way of salvation, but they'll tell you all kinds of shortcuts. They'll do things that even tell you you don't need God to get approval. And, and I mean, we have a, a buffet of religion out here in our culture that is really, really a mess. And I like buffets, but I would not put broccoli and blueberries together and or a lot of other things together. And you don't need to do that spiritually either and biblically. You need to stay with God's truth. Paul's reminding Timothy that there is a true gospel, that there is God's truth, that there is one way and one life, and, and that it's in Jesus Christ, and he wants him to understand that. He's now going to start celebrating the significance of God's grace and God's mercy. I really like that picture. That's really neat. And it actually does look a little bit like our back lane, except for we don't have the wooden picket fence. So um, that's, that'll be our next project. And I said, I told Beverly, I, I asked her where she found it. She, she, this was not a local picture. And um, I said, well, and I think we do have the mud ruts too running through there, but right now they're snowy. But anyhow, it's a pretty picture. Paul was very, very thankful. He was thankful for several levels, and, and that's what he's expressed here. First of all, he's thankful that God chose him. And he takes a look at, you know, everybody that's around, and it's like, why would God do that? Why would he choose me? And, and Paul's just uh, amazed at that. Uh, he was ever mindful that it was God that chose him. It was not him who chose God. Don't ever get into that mindset where you think, well, you know, God is really lucky that I'm on his team. <laughs> That's not a good picture. That's not a good thought pattern. You are not in that category. Either am I. None of us are. The Apostle Paul was not. Always be mindful and thankful that God chose you and that God trusted him. Now, that's an interesting concept that God trusted him, but it says that he considered me faithful in verse 12. He considered me faithful. And the word faithful there is the same word that's translated often as believing. He considered me believing. He trusted my faith in him, that I was sincere. He trusted me so he could entrust me with certain responsibilities. And then he appointed him. He appointed him to serve. Paul was given the commission by God. Paul was absolutely convinced that he was right where God wanted him to be. He knew that what he was doing was what God wanted him to do because God appointed him to do that. You can know that as well. You can know that as well, that you are doing what God wants you to do when you follow God's leading and you trust him and you do the things that he's asked of you. You can have that kind of confidence. And then the next word, I actually have two words to fill in here. You could put he enabled him. I think I also used the word he empowered him. Um, but it's, I do believe it's true. I think this is absolutely a true pattern that um, if God calls you and he entrusts you and he appoints you to a responsibility, uh, I think he's going to enable or empower you to, to do that responsibility. I think he's going to help you accomplish the things that he has for you to do. He's not going to abandon you. He's not going to leave you out on your own. Paul remembered his own sin. In verse 13, he's going to tell us a little bit about that. And you would say, well, now why would he want to do that? Why would he want to dwell on, on the sin that is part of his life? Because that just feels and sounds so negative. Why, why dwell on that kind of stuff? Well, I think that Paul kept that always in the front of his mind for a couple reasons. One is it kept him humble. It kept him from from growing in a, a spirit of pride. Uh, he didn't want to all of a sudden take the view of, I am the great apostle. He didn't want to have that. He, he looked at himself more as, I am the great sinner. And it kept him very humble before God, but it also gave him a, a spirit of gratitude. It kept that aflamed and alive within him so that he was always thankful for God for what he had done in his life. Uh, there's a couple other passages, and here you've seen where he talks about himself as being such a great sinner. In, in 1 Corinthians 15, 9 and 10, he calls himself the least of the apostles. 
And in Ephesians 3, 8, he, call, he says, I'm the very least of all saints. <laughs> so, and I don't think that were, those were just words that Paul was spitting out there so that people would take pity on him. I think he honestly had a spirit of which he felt like, you know what? With what I have done to offend Jesus Christ, what I have done to sin against God, uh, I am not worthy of any of this. I am not worthy of his love. I am not worthy of his grace. I am not worthy of his mercy. He's going to tell you what he did. Uh, he remembered his own sin, and, and look at what he did. He, uh, he was a blasphemer. He blasphemed God. Now, that means that he slandered God. And not only did he slander God, but he forced other people, even Christians, to attempt to slander God. Now remember, uh, he was a pretty violent guy for a while before he converted, and people were being put to death, some were being tortured, some were being arrested, and he did all he could do to get those Christians to deny Jesus Christ. He was a blasphemer, and then it goes with that, but he was a persecutor. And by persecuting people, he was extremely relentless. He wouldn't let go. He was a pit bull against Christians. He would chomp down on them, and, and it was not unusual for him to drag people out of their homes, to separate families, to have them arrested, to have them beaten, and even to have some put to death. Now, we have real good information and, and reasons to believe, and the book of Acts is pretty clear, but um, when Stephen, well, who is considered the first Christian martyr, that when he was martyred, the Apostle Paul, who was then outside of Christ, he was not a believer, but he was probably very, very significant in that event in having Stephen stoned and put to death. And Paul was just relentless in this. He, his desire was to annihilate everything Christian. That's what he wanted to do. He wanted to wipe this Jesus thing right off the map if there was any way to do it. Therefore, he was a very violent aggressor. Um, he had no concern whatsoever for any human kindness. It didn't matter if it was a man, if it was a woman, a woman holding on to a little baby. It did not matter. Anything that he had to do to wipe this out, he was going to do that. He had no concern for the people uh, who he was tormenting. In verse 13, uh, you can see at the end of that, that he says, I was shown mercy. And, and that phrase, I was shown, the way that the, uh, the Greek tense is, I, I like this one commentator translated it, I was mercied. That's a neat, non-usable word, but I was mercied. That's what happened to him. God mercied him uh, in spite of, and he said, you know, it's because I was ignorant, I was outside, I, I was trying to be zealous, but I wasn't doing the right thing, I was wrong. Um, it almost sounds like Paul's differentiating different categories there. I, I had written in here at this point, I told David uh, that I'd written into my sermon uh, the words to a song that I was going to read to you. The song was called, There's a Wideness in God's Mercy. But Dave picked it out and we sang it today. So I don't have to read all of it to you. But I do think, isn't that an amazing concept that, you know, it's as wide as the sea and it's justice, uh, you know, it's just so kind and great and his love's broad and it's bigger than our minds can imagine and, and his eternity. It's more wonderful than anything we can figure out. Paul's wretchedness was met by God's compassion. Isn't that great? Isn't that just great? Your wretchedness was met by God's compassion. And yes, you are wretched, by the way, <laughs> and so am I. You're wretched, but I'm worse. I know that. And, uh, and yet, we're all met by God's compassion. Grace is what God gives to us to take away the guilt. He's, he's rescued us from our sin, and the mercy sounds like, maybe feels like, it's the part where he removes the misery that we're in, the misery that we have because of our sins, and he takes that away. He says in verses 15 and 16 that this is a trustworthy statement, and it's an eight-word, nine-word summary. And you're like, Pastor Bud, can't you count? It's either eight or it's nine, right? Okay, it's nine in English, it's eight in the Greek, but um, it's an eight-word, nine-word summary of the gospel. 
uh, he uses a couple words. He says Christ, and, and Christ is the anointed king. That's the Messiah. He's the anointed one. Uh, it tells us Jesus, uh, Christ Jesus. Uh, it's referring to the incarnate God. It's when he uh, became humanity. Uh, it does say that he came to the world, and, and you know, that, that's the incarnation also, but it also implies his pre-existence, because Jesus always existed. He is God, he's part of the Godhead, he's always been there with us. Uh, he's here, and, and he came. Uh, and it says that he, he came into the world, um, and that's not just the globe of trees and rocks and dirt and water but it's uh, referring to the whole of humanity, everything, particularly the lostness of humanity. And his reason to come was to save sinners. That was the purpose of why he came. That's the gospel in eight words. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, period. That's it. Of course, Paul's going to add that he was the absolute worst of any of those that needed to be saved, and I would say, so am I, and I think you could say, so are you. So are you. It's kind of interesting then, because Paul's going to break out into a, a neat doxology in verse 17. Uh, we've already read it once, but what a, what a neat thing. Now to the King eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. It's almost like he can't contain himself any longer. He's got to break out and, and say these great, great things that, that God has done. And uh, here he talks about Jesus, and he calls him the king. He's the Lord Jesus Christ as king. Um, it's not your favorite basketball player, he's not the king. Uh, it's not your favorite politician, he's not a king. It's not your favorite whatever. But Jesus Christ is the king. He's eternal. He's of all the ages. He's immortal. Uh, he never will face the decay of death. Not going to experience that. He is invisible in the sense that he's only revealed to those who he chooses to reveal himself to. He's the only God. He's the only one that there is. He's the only one worthy of being God. And, and most commentators say that that verse 17 is sort of like a blip in this chapter. It's sort of like a parenthesis that doesn't fit. Because here he is talking about his salvation experience because he's dealing with false teachers and he's trying to tell them what the gospel really is. So he tells his experience and now he's going to remind Timothy in verses 18, 19, and 20 about how important it is to stay with the truth. And then here's two examples of guys that went screwy. And um, so he's, he's there, but right in the middle of that he does this doxology. And I don't think it's a blip at all. I think it's well, I think that what happened was Paul in recounting his own life and talking about lostness and, and hearing the voice of Christ and coming to Christ as Savior and thinking about I was a blasphemer and a persecutor and an aggressive violator of human people, but Christ saved me. How, how else could he do it? I mean, he's shouting and screaming with joy in his heart how wonderful God is to him. And we should do that as well. In verses 18 to 20, I wrote, what's with these guys? <laughs> you know, it's like, where are they coming from? Who are these people? What's going on with them? Uh, Timothy, of course, is addressed first. He's okay. I don't have a problem with that. Now, the rest of the world looks at us, and, we, and I say, Timothy's okay. I might say, I'm okay to a degree. And, and the rest of the world say, boy, are they weird. You know, what's wrong with them? Uh, they're not in step with everything else. They don't do all the weird and evil and, and perverted things we do. What's wrong with them? Um, I think Timothy's okay. It's the other two guys are really going to be a problem. And here, Paul is reminding Timothy that in light of all this stuff, you've got false teachers you're dealing with, you've got the significant church that you're trying to lead, you've got people coming to Christ and good things are happening, and in spite of all that stuff, you've got to stay alert to the fact that all of life 
as long as you're here, Timothy, all of life is going to be a spiritual warfare. It's all a war. And uh, in fact, the, the language that he uses here is very much in it. It says in verse uh, 18, Timothy, my son, I give you this instruction. That, that is nowhere near as strong. This is a command. This is a military type command. And saying to him, uh, this is in keeping with all the prophecies that were made about you. This was what uh, somebody in the church at one time probably prophesied that Timothy was going to be a leader in the church. And um, in, in light of all that, he says, this is what you've got to do, that by following them, you may fight the good fight, holding on to the faith and good conscience. Earlier, last two weeks ago, we talked about how very vital the truth of the Word of God is. Timothy, no matter what else you've got to do, cling to the Word of God. That is, that is your life source. That's the only valid uh, of authority that you have in life. Cling to that. And now Paul is saying to him, I'm giving you a direct command, a direct command that you fight that fight that is noble and good and that you stay in it. It's a spiritual war, Timothy. You've got to stay in there. Hang in there. you got to do the right stuff. Satanic opposition is going to come, and it's going to be fierce, and it's going to be strong. And in Ephesus, the enemy already is encroaching at your doorstep. Satan has already attacked you. He's already got people lined up against you. He's already working in the hearts of those who are not committed, and, and he's trying to get people to do all the wrong stuff. you got false teachers. you got false leaders. you got all kinds of things that are going on that are not proper and not accurate. And this is a command, Timothy. It's not a suggestion. It's a mandate. And he says that he's going to entrust to him. It's what's been entrusted to him. It's, um, it's a deposit. A deposit. We, we picked for our theme this year uh, the, the words deposit required. And, and I think I suggested to you a few weeks ago that what we want to try to emphasize, emphasize this year is, you know, the fact that we need to, to pour ourselves into other people to help them to prepare in life, to live for Christ, to serve Christ, to honor Christ. That's what is always a heartbeat of our church. That's why we do many of the things that we do and try and to, to impact, especially younger people. That's why we're talking about the books of Timothy because it's Paul pouring himself into a younger person. That deposit is required of us to do. If we want the faith to live on, if we want the testimony, it doesn't matter about Grace Ripman. I mean, it's a great church and it's very important, but this church will have it had a beginning. Someday it'll have an end. We don't want it to be under our watch, but someday it'll have an end, and, and that's okay, but we want the people and the faith to go on for generations and generations, as long as Jesus uh, will allow us to do that. This word deposit and trusting that Paul is using here for Timothy is the, uh, the idea of committing something very, very precious, something very valuable into the care of someone else. You could take any illustration you want on that. It's as if somebody said, this is the, uh, the jewelry that's been passed down for generations from my family. I want you to take care of this. Don't let anything happen to it. I remember years and years and years ago, and this actually turned out, this is a good story. This is, uh, I've got lots of bad stories, but this is a good one, where um, uh, Floyd and Laura Moyne, part of our church, wonderful part of our church, and uh, they came to me one time, or I came to them, or whatever happened, but they asked me one time, uh, they said, you know, they were getting older, and they had a family Bible that dated back to like the 1830s, 1840s. It was huge. It was easily the size of this podium, and it had an unbelievable cover. With an, I mean, it was very, very, very fancy, and they were concerned about what was going to happen to it, and, um, and they asked me to keep it for them, which is real easy because I keep everything. There's nothing that's not been pass through, I, even fruitcake, I keep everything. So, so it's like, sure, I don't mind keeping that. So I put it up in my cabinet and, and I had it there. 
And a year or two later, Floyd and Laura moved into the nursing home, and, and that was okay, that was an okay move, they needed to do that. And about a week or two after they did that, they discovered that all of their family pictures and all those kinds of things were in the box that somehow accidentally got put out at the curb to be thrown out. So all of their valuable stuff, uh, family remembrances, everything was gone, everything uh, out in the trash, gone. And uh, that was obviously a very devastating thing. When I heard about that, I felt horrible for them, went to see them, see if they were okay and all that kind of stuff. And then I reminded them, I said, you know, we do have your Bible still. Who do you want to get that? They were thrilled. I mean, the Bible was, to them, more important because of the agedness. It had all of their genealogies, everything, back from the mid-1800s and earlier. So um, they, not that I was worthy, but they entrusted something very valuable. Entrust a child to the care of somebody else or, or whatever you want to do. That's what Paul is telling Timothy that he's entrusting God's truth. It is a treasure that we must preserve and protect, and you have to fight that good campaign to save it. That fight is worthy and it is noble. He uses in there the idea of conscience, and conscience is knowing within oneself. It's, it's knowing who we are. It's linked to faith. Um, conscience is what God gives us, and it either accuses us or excuses us when we're doing certain things. It is God's purpose that through our conscience, he can warn us when we're sinning. God doesn't want us to sin, and of course the Holy Spirit uses that and, and sparks inside of us. And, and the way to have a good, pure life is to have good, pure doctrine or teaching or belief system in what God has taught us. And we need to train our conscience. You don't just, I mean, you get one automatically. They're passed out at, at birth. It, you know, when they take your fingerprints or footprints, it's, it's already there. Uh, it's embedded in you. God gives you a conscience automatically, but you need to instruct it and to train it, and you need to do it by biblical standards. Now, you could do it by the world standards, and you're going to believe what the world believes, and your conscience will agree with whatever you you think is right and wrong, so if you think certain murder situations are okay, then it's okay. You think certain immorality situations are okay, then it's okay, according to your conscience. But you would rather train it in something that is right as opposed to what is wrong, and that's important. A conscience, one, one illustration I saw, and I think this is accurate, a conscience is a lot like a rubber band. I don't have a rubber band, and I thought if I did, this wouldn't work anyhow. But, uh, you know, a rubber band is something you can stretch. You can keep taking it and stretching it and pulling it out. And, and our conscience is like that. You can stretch your conscience. But you know what happens when you keep stretching a rubber band is eventually it loses its elasticity. It's not going to stay elastic very long. And, in fact, at some point, and, boy, haven't you had that happen, ouch, it snaps. It breaks, and your conscience will do that too. You keep testing and pulling and snapping your conscience, it will break on you. Now, Paul brings up that stern rebuke on these two guys who really messed up. Uh, they had turned away from the truth, and they started to believe these blasphemous um, errors of Scripture. The one guy is Hymenaeus. And uh, he's mentioned again later in 2 Timothy chapter 2, and in there he's grouped with another guy, and, he, and it's reminded to Timothy that they're both false teachers. So we do see him appear again. Alexander, there is an Alexander Coppersmith that's mentioned in 2 Timothy 4, but the name Alexander was pretty popular. You know, it wasn't too long ago that Alexander the Great was great, at least in some people's eyes. So that was a pretty popular Greek name. So we don't know for absolute sure uh, that these are the same Alexanders. But um, both of them, uh, Paul says something kind of interesting that most of you probably don't like, and I probably don't like either, until we learn a little bit more what it means. He says that they were handed over to Satan. That Paul, Paul says, we're just handing those two guys over to Satan. Let Satan do what he wants with them. Now, before you panic on that, uh, that's happened a lot of times, even in Scripture. 
For instance, uh, there was a king in Israel named Saul, and ultimately God turned him over to Satan because he didn't obey, didn't follow, uh, did a lot of things wrong. Uh, there was a guy named Judas who was uh, ultimately turned over to Satan because of his uh, betrayal of Christ. But there are some good examples of people who were turned over to Satan to be tested. One guy named Job. Have you heard of him? He's, um, he is a, a great man of God. And God, in spite of the fact that he was a rich believer and follower of God, God allowed Satan to take him past the limit past any limit you and I have ever gone through. What about Jesus in Matthew chapter 4? After he fasted and was out in the wilderness, God allowed Satan to go in and tempt him, and then tempt him again, and then tempt him again, although without any failure whatsoever. Luke chapter 22, verses 31 to 33, shows us another experience. Revelation chapter 7, verses 9 through 15, talk about all the martyrs that that um, when they were pulled together before the throne. There's, there's a reason why God allows people to be handed over to Satan. Um, the, the bad purpose is because, um, oh, I guess I listed it different than I thought I did. Uh, this is a good purpose. <laughs> this is not a bad purpose. It's to show the genuineness of their faith. He, he wanted to prove that they were, like, that's Job. Didn't he? He wanted to prove to, to Satan and everybody else that Job was, was very genuine. Uh, he wanted to keep them humble and to keep them uh, committed to him, dependent upon him. He wanted to enable them to, to through their work, to be able to strengthen others um, and also to give them an opportunity to offer praise to God. These are all reasons why God might allow Satan to do things in people's lives. There's probably many, many more. These are just general ideas. Here's another one for judgment, for judgment. That's probably Hymenius. That's probably Alexander. That's probably Judas. That's probably King Saul. That's probably a lot of other people. Here, I think um, Paul is saying, you know, we're going to hand them over and let God judge them. Their, their support system was so different. Their world was so different than ours. Uh, when you became a believer in their world, you really needed to connect with other believers. You had to. They were your lifeline because the rest of the world hated you and was against you and wanted to do everything they could to get rid of you and uh, if you were sincere. And you needed that lifeline. And here Paul's saying, let's cut the lifeline. If they're going to continue to teach false teaching, then let's let them go out there with the, with the heathen, let's let them dwell with the evil and, and let them either come back to Christ in repentance or, or let them be judged for who they are. Um, and then he even says that they may be taught not to blaspheme so that they learn how not to be a blasphemer of God. Well, the important message here that, that Paul is communicating to Timothy that I think we need to remind ourselves about is the very importance of God's word and, and of his work and how we need to do what Christ has called us to do. We have to stay in the fight. And many times it's really tempting to give up. Uh, our culture has been bred to believe that at a certain age that you deserve a break today. You just go ahead and take off, and the rest of the world caters to you from now on. Uh, and we believe that in our culture, that Burger King mentality of have it your way, and, and you deserve the break today, that we all deserve stuff, and we all have things coming to us. And God says you need to hang in there and, and stay connected to the truth and stay in the fight for truth. Now, I'm not suggesting to you that you start picket lines or, or get into debates with superior scholars or anything like that. That's not what we're doing. But we need to know and live the truth daily. Let's pray together. Father, how we thank you for the reminder and the challenge to live for you, because that is something that we're tempted to waver in. And Lord, we just pray that you would just garner up our hearts, strengthen us, Help us to, to live the way you desire for us to live. 
Lord, we want to just open ourselves to you and allow you to speak to us clearly. And as much as possible, we want to respond to you. And we just want you to enable and empower us to live to your honor and glory. We pray that this would be pleasing in your sight, that you would receive the victories and all the spoils, and that we could just be your humble servants and do what pleases you. In Christ's name we ask. Amen.